God who knows us by name, He cares about each and every one of us. He cares about you today, what you're feeling, what you're going through, what's coming. He's already ahead of you on that. He's a good, good father. Better. I mean, some of you have great fathers. God's a better father. He's the best father, and He loves you.
it's really not that much you can say take it Lord I give it up when I finally let go of it all turn my eyes to see your face you come to make it all I can But it's all useless in my hands My pride built up these fragile walls As I surrender I know that they will fall Please, the chains help me bound to my own fear, chasing my own ground. Oh, lay them down. This is where my freedom's found. Holy surrender. Holy Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jared and Amanda. We have, it's a great, I can serve a God that'll chase you down, right? He's not chasing you down to scold you. He's chasing you down to set you free. And uh, we are so thankful to have a God that's relentless in his pursuit of us. Luke chapter 24 is where we will be uh, reading from in just a couple of moments. Today, uh, we start a series called Jesus Out of Nowhere. And uh, we're really excited about that. Three post-resurrection appearances of Jesus where where they thought he was dead, but all of a sudden Jesus started appearing out of nowhere. How many of you know Jesus still shows up out of nowhere in our lives today? When we least expect it, sometimes 
we can expect it, that Jesus will show up out of nowhere. And so this message today, next week we'll be talking about doubt, how sometimes God, anybody ever doubt before? Sometimes right in the middle of nowhere, Jesus shows up in the midst of our doubts and he helps us. He helps us beat those doubts and find fresh faith in the, the last week uh, as well, a message about out of nowhere, second chances. Take these and hand them out to people. God still believes in us. The last week, second chances. Well, uh, we're looking forward to this series. Like I said, after his resurrection, Jesus appeared several times to different ones of his followers, uh, and he's still doing that today. And if you're waiting, if you're waiting for him to show up, if you think that Jesus is too late for you, if you have doubts, about his existence, if you feel like you blew it so bad he has no interest in hanging out with you, again, then this three-week series is for you. Sometimes when you least expect it, Jesus shows up out of nowhere. Today, I want you to read with me from uh, Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 13. We're going to go on a road trip with Jesus today, all right? Here we go, Luke chapter 13. If you uh, want to take notes, there's notes inside of your bulletin today, or you can do it on version, which I'm reading uh, the Bible this morning. It's an incredible app free uh, for you to download. It gives you daily devotions and the Bible and all kinds of different translations. I'm reading from the Good News translation as starting at verse 13. On the same day that there was this crazy news stirring that the tomb was empty and Jesus was missing. On the same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village named Emmaus and about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking to each other about all the things that had happened, and a lot had happened in the last few days. And as they talked and discussed, Jesus himself drew near and walked along with them, and they saw him, but somehow they did not recognize him, and Jesus said to them, hey, what are you talking about to each other as you walk along? And they stood still with sad faces. And one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know all the things that have been happening here these last few days? What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. This man was a prophet, was considered by God and uh, and by all the people to be powerful in everything he said and did. And our chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And he was crucified. And we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to set Israel free. Besides all that, this is now the third day since it happened, and some of our women of our group surprised us. They went at dawn to the tomb but could not find his body. And they came back saying they had seen a vision of angels who told them he's alive. Some of our group went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see him. And then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, how slow you are to believe everything the prophets said. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? And Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of the prophets. And as they came near to the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further, but they held him back saying, Stay with us. The day is almost over and it's getting dark. And so he went in to stay with them and he sat down to eat with them and he took the bread and he said the blessing he broke the bread and he gave it to him and then their eyes were open and they recognized him but he disappeared from their sight and they said to each other wasn't it like a fire burning in us when he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us and they got up at once and went back to Jerusalem where they found the 11 disciples gathered together with the others saying the Lord He is risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. And the two of them then explained to what happened to them on the road and how they had recognized the Lord when he broke the bread. You may want to keep your finger in the uh, passage of Scripture there or uh, keep that open to that as we refer to it today. You know, we are all travelers on the road of life. And some of us on that road are disciples of Jesus. And some of us or not. Either way, we're all on a road trip through life, and there's so much to learn on the journey, so much to experience, so many critical decisions that we must make along the way, and we will never pass this way again. This is our one time through this journey, on this road, and one day sooner than we expect, 
we come to the end of the journey. And at the end, we'll look back down the road and we'll wonder to ourselves things like this. Did I travel well on the road of life? Did I get to all the places that I was supposed to go, that God intended for me to go? Did I meet all the people that I was supposed to meet? Did I do all the things that God put me here to do while I was traveling this road? Did I live out my dream? Did I live out God's dream for my life? Did I walk on the road with dignity and with courage? Did I take the road less traveled or did I instead take the path of compromise? And as my journey comes to an end, we'll look back someday down the road and we'll ask ourselves, am I confident that the path I've taken will lead me to the right eternal destination? We're all traveling the road of life together. And wherever you're at on the road, I want you to consider a question this morning. And here it is. What are or are there advantages to traveling with Jesus on the road of life? Are there advantages And if so, what are they? And for me, I say yes. I say there's some big advantages to walking on the road of life with Jesus. But I'm asking the question of you. And today, through this story of these guys that met Jesus on a road trip, I want you to see some of the advantages, in my opinion, of walking with Jesus. Here's the big idea of the message. The longer you walk on the road of life with Jesus the more you discover about who He is, about who you are, and about God's eternal purpose for your life. The longer you travel with Jesus on the road, the more you find out about who He is and who you are and about your eternal purpose in life. Now, here's three advantages of walking or to walking with Jesus. Number one is this. When you walk with Jesus, He walks with you in the hard places. When you walk with Jesus through life, he will walk with you through the hard places. Verse 17, Jesus comes along out of nowhere and he says, fellas, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And it says, they stood still, their faces downcast. That paints a picture, doesn't it? How many of you have ever stood still with your face hanging down, right? Downcast. You were singing the blues as you walked along the road. How many of you have ever experienced car troubles before when you were on a road trip? Huh? Anybody? Raise it up real high. You've had a car break. Oh, yeah, most of it. Isn't that fun? Like, especially like if it's during a driving rainstorm or something like a snowstorm. That's great, right? I mean, sometimes I see people and I just instantly, I, I hurt for them when I see them out. And it's like 10 degrees and they've got a flat tire. And you're like, oh, man, that's just a bummer. And so I think of some of the times when I've broken down with my family before. One time we were had our family was young and we had an old beater station wagon because we didn't have a lot of money. Somebody kind of half gave it to us, and you know what that's like. And so we got this old beater blue station wagon, and we're headed to Cincinnati for Thanksgiving. And I remember that thing went dead somewhere outside of Smithton, Pennsylvania. And I remember us, thank God, that we were able to coast downhill and off of the exit and right to a gas station. But it was Thanksgiving, and nobody was open, you know. But at least we were off the road. I was just, like, relieved. I remember another time for Tristan's birthday. I think it was her 16th birthday, and she wanted to go to New York City for her birthday. We lived about three hours from there. So we went there. We spent the day there. We had a great time. And on the way home, my father-in-law's conversion van, beautiful conversion van, leather seats, all kinds of, it was loaded, man. And that baby died in New York City. You know what happens to cars that are left alone in New York City? You come back in 10 minutes, and they're up on blocks and stripped down, right? And I will never forget that because it was Saturday, and I'm a pastor, and so I got church the next day, and I remember the one guy's, it was my daughter's at the time, boyfriend, he, he drove back from Hazel, up from Hazleton to pick us up at, while my wife and the two boys spent the night in the motel to get the van fixed, and Tristan and I had to drive three hours. We got back two hours before service and had to lead worship and preach. Oh, it was fun. I remember another time, Charlie, when we were coming back from Cincinnati and we were on the Pennsylvania Turnpike in an old beater. Uh, well, it wasn't a beater, but it, it had its issues with a van, a Dodge van. And uh, I remember we were in those cattle chutes. 
and we got up over the top and something electronically went wrong and it's a one lane cattle shoot on the Pennsylvania Turnpike and our van died and suddenly I realized we were just over the crest of the hill and vehicles are coming full speed and I got out of that, I'll never forget, running down that, running that through those cattle chutes, going, slow down, slow down, because I could just see what would happen if a semi came at 60 miles an hour up through that cattle chute and rear-ended our van. Man, it was scary. Breakdowns, hard places on the road to life. Sometimes we experience hard places. Things break unexpectedly. You lose your job. Your fiance, fiance tells you, I don't want to get married anymore. The wedding is off. Your marriage is falling apart. You weren't expecting it. Your child is diagnosed with some sort of a critical disease. You lose the baby. Hard places in life. You weren't counting on them. And all of a sudden, something broke down. You're faced with an uncertain future. You have no clue which way to go or what to do. You're in an accident. You're being treated terribly by your boss. You're being abused by your spouse. Your daughter or your son is on drugs. It's a hard place in the road of life. And life has its share of difficult spots. Doubt and discouragement and confusion and a sense of hopelessness crash in upon you. And you feel like quitting. You feel like life isn't worth living. You have no energy at saps your enthusiasm and your hope and that's how these two disciples must have felt Jesus comes along suddenly in the hard place of the road uh, with them and he says what are you guys talking about where have you been you've been under a rock somewhere I mean hear the disappointment in their words our Savior's dead, executed on a Roman cross three days ago and this is the part that jumps out at me verse 21 we had hoped we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Translation, he's not who we thought he was. We had hoped and he did not live up to our expectations. We put all our hope in him and he let us down and now he's dead or at least we think he's dead because this morning some of the ladies went and they come back with this crazy story that the tomb's empty and that he's alive and we don't know what to believe. And they stood on the road their faces downcast. And the message says this. They just stood there long-faced like they had lost their best friend. And they had. And it's a hard place on the road that Jesus shows up out of nowhere. And that's what he does. I mean, I found that to be true. When I thought he was not anywhere in sight, all of a sudden out of nowhere, Jesus just shows up. And he didn't say a whole lot at first. He just walked along and he listened. Listen, here's a good statement for you. Don't mistake God's silence for his absence. Don't mistake his silence for his absence. Sometimes he's just walking and listening and he's just there, and he listens to our stories. He, listens, he enters into our pain. He feels our disappointment. And yet, somehow, when we need him most, it seems like sometimes he's just nowhere to be found. And I think it's interesting to read verses 15 to 16. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Isn't that interesting? Jesus either temporarily disguised himself or perhaps their pain and their grief was so deep. Have you ever been there before? That you just couldn't see hope or help when it was right in front of you. You just hurt to, I don't know what it was, but Jesus was right there and they didn't recognize him. I wonder how many times that's happened to me. He was right there and I failed to see him. Here's another thing I would encourage you to remember. Just because you don't recognize Jesus or can't see him doesn't mean he's not there. Just because you can't see him or recognize him doesn't mean he's not there. Now, I'm certain somebody needs to hear this. Jesus is with you today, even if you can't see him or hear him. And the road that you're walking on is really hard. And he's with you every step of the way. And he's listening. And understand this, he sees every tear and he hears every cry of your heart. And he's holding you more than you realize. And don't lose hope. Keep walking. Keep believing. We walk by faith and not by sight. David said, even 
even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not afraid because I know you're there. Your rod and your staff will comfort me. Jesus is there. He walks with us in the hard places of life on the road to discovery. This is an advantage of walking with Jesus. When you go through a hard place, you're not alone. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I'm with you always. Here's a second advantage to walking with Jesus. Jesus gives directions along the way. Jesus gives directions along the way. Jesus says to them, How foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And he explains to them what the Scripture said concerning himself. And these two disciples are walking along this hard stretch of road, and Jesus lets them finish their story, and then he begins giving these two discouraged travelers new directions. How many of you have ever gotten lost on a trip before? Huh? Come on, guys. I did not see one hand out there. How many of you guys, you know, it's it's over now. You can look back and say, yes, I was in fact lost. How many of you guys? Come on, be honest. Okay, there are some honest guys in the crowd. I know you will find this hard to believe, but even I, with my inborn manly sense of direction, have from time to time gotten lost. But how about it, guys? Do we stop and ask for directions? There it is. Absolutely not. Why? Because we're men. And we know exactly where we're going. And it's just another mile or two down the road, sweetheart. Trust me on this. And 30 miles later, after some warm, wonderful communication with my wife, my frustration level reaches its peak, and I pull over and say, I'm lost. These guys are walking with Jesus and he starts giving them directions to get out of this hard place on the road that they're in and move forward. But there's two roadblocks that they've got to get around. Here's the first one, the roadblock of pride. That's why we don't stop and ask for directions, guys. Because we're men. We know what we're doing. You know, we have this inborn sense of how to get there. We can't admit that we might be err. Most of us don't like somebody telling us what to do. Isn't it interesting that the little lady on the GPS is a lady? Right? How come you're not yelling at her? You know, how come you're not switching it over to a man voice? Because you don't want to get more lost. And Jesus comes on pretty strong with these guys, doesn't he? Like, how would you, how many of you would like to be walking with Jesus? And he says, how foolish you are. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Appreciate that. And how slow of heart to believe. He's, I mean, you're like, that's not a very nice way to talk to someone, Jesus. You know what? Jesus loves us enough to tell us what we need to hear. You know, we get stuck on the side of the road in our little pity parties. You been there before? Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. Think I'll eat some worms, you know? Like, oh, you know, the sky is falling. The whole world's terrible. Everybody hates me. Nobody likes me. All that kind of stuff. Life stinks, man. Everything I do turns out wrong. I'm just a big old loser. I mean, I'm the biggest loser of them all. I got no talent. I got no friends. I got no hair. My dog doesn't even like me. <laughs> right? You're laughing, but you've been there. You've been there, and Jesus loves you enough to step into your little pity party and say, Snap out of it, man! You're acting like a foolish person. Just listen to yourself. Shake it off, man. You got a great wife. You got a great life. You got kids. You got a roof over your head. You got a car to drive. On and on it go. And you're sitting here having your little pity party. And he gives us directions to get us out of the hard place that we're in. But we're reluctant to receive them. And he might use your wife, guys. I, I swear that my wife and the Holy Spirit like have a direct link, Pastor Matt. And sometimes she says stuff to me, and I'm, I'm like, 
I don't like that. And I go over in a corner somewhere and I'm like, I don't like it because she's right. And that's probably God talking to me through her. And I'd be smart to listen. Sometimes he uses a good friend that has the guts to look at you and say, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? That's dumb, man. That's foolish. Maybe it's a counselor. Maybe it's something you read in the Bible that slaps you in the face one day and you're like, whoa. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will just nail you with something. You're like, oh, you're out of line. Because he loves us, God sends somebody to give us a spiritual slap in the face, a snap out of it moment. You know our most common reaction? We get ticked off. We get ticked off. Why? Because we don't like somebody telling us what to do. Why? Pride. Pride. I'm right. i got to be right. We don't want and need directions. We are perfectly capable of getting ourselves out of trouble all by ourselves. Thank you very much. Ten years later... Like, I should have listened to dad. Should have listened to grandma. Should have listened to my youth pastor. But I had pride. It's the roadblock of pride. God shows up out of nowhere, sends us help, and we won't listen. Come on, right now. How many of you can look back and say, I can remember a a time in my life when somebody tried to save me a lot of grief, and I blew it off. Right? It's amazing the perspective that some hard knocks on the road of life will give, right? Right? Have you done this like me before? Ooh, I wish I had listened. Right? Some people would rather be miserable and lose everything that matters than to reach out for help. That's worth repeating. Because it might, it might identify somebody sitting here today. You'll be the way you are till you decide to do something different. Some people, I'm, concer- I'm, I'm, I'm convinced, would rather be miserable and lose everything that matters in life than to reach out for help. You ever meet somebody like that? You're like, you just want to snap out of it, dude. Everything's at stake here. Don't you see this? The second roadblock is the roadblock of unbelief. When we find ourselves in a hard place on the road, it's often a test that God allowed to come into our lives to see how much we trust Him. And the test usually has something to do with measuring our level of faith and who God says he is to us. He says all these things to us, and we're like, "Woo, man, we amen it, and we shout it, and we sing it in church on Sunday morning when everything's cool, but when you're on a hard place in the road, all of a sudden you're like, hmm, not sure if he, where is he? I said, I thought he was here. He said I could always count on him. Jesus says, how slow of heart to believe, I love this, all the prophets said. Verse 26 Did not the Christ, you guys are good Jewish boys, did not the Christ, according to the prophecies, didn't he he have to suffer all this? What about he was wounded of our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with our stripes we were healed. That's the prophecy, just as much as he'll be a mighty counselor, uh, 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 almighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. Fellas, you, you left half of the prophecies out, didn't you? Don't you remember all the prophecies? The one set said he was going to come and suffer and die. And then another set said he's going to come back as king of kings and lord of lords. And he begins with Moses. And he reminds them of all the scriptures said about him. God wants your faith in him to grow. Do you believe that? How is it possible if you won't let him stretch it? How many of you think there's maybe a thing or two about the scriptures you still don't know? I mean, if you think maybe there's a thing or two about God, you've still not understood. And so he's there going, guys, you think you understand. You only, oh, you got a little bit like this. There's a whole bunch more that you don't understand. Let me ask you some questions. Was Abraham's faith in God greater or less when he came down the mountain after God asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar? Right? Right? Greater. He came down and he found out God provides the lamb. I mean, everything I am belongs to him. Was David's faith in God greater or less after he defeated Goliath on the field of battle? It's greater. Was that a hard time? Are you kidding me? Terrifying. Face a nine-foot-tall giant. 
But unless you face the giants in the whole hard road places of life, then you can't walk away going, man, I know God better now. I know he can whoop giants. I didn't know that before. Or I heard somebody else say it, but now I've been there. Was Daniel's faith in God greater or less after he spent the night with the kitties in, you know, in the lion's den, right? He loved God. He thought God was awesome. But he walked out of there saying, my God is able to close the mouths of lions. And when you go through the hard place, you look back and you go, God's bigger. He's better. He's stronger. He's everything he said he was. But I, knew, I had to get desperate and get through some hard place. See him bring me through something. Nobody likes hard place, but everybody likes when the hard place is over and you look back and you go, there was God. He was strong. He was able. We always grow the most in the hard places on the road. And if you'll listen and you'll trust him, that's exactly where Jesus steps in out of nowhere and he starts giving you fresh direction and he reminds you of stuff you already know but you needed to live it to make it really real. And it's exactly what he did with these two disciples. They knew the prophecies that the Messiah would have to suffer and die but they only held on to their belief about the Messiah being a conquering king and a deliverer and Jesus says, fellas, don't just believe some of what God says, believe it all. And if you're in a hard place, Jesus wants to challenge your faith with fresh direction. When he said, never will I leave you or forsake you, I'm with you always. When he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. When he said, God works things, all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Those aren't just nice little Sunday school memory verses for Sunday school kids. Those are directions from Jesus on the road to discover. You've got to live them out to prove that they're real. So if you're up against one or both of those roadblocks, here's two critical questions you've got to answer. How will I respond to Jesus' rebuke? How will I respond when Jesus looks me in the eye and says, what about this? This is a problem in your life. How foolish you are to keep doing this one more day. How will you respond to his, will I let go of pride, will I let it get in the way, or will I humble myself and say, you're right. You're right, Jesus. I need directions. Second one, will I trust his explanation? Will I trust his, or will I let unbelief cause me to reject what he said I could count on him to do? How will you ever know you really trust God until you trust him when the road is hard and the days are long? And the nights are dark. Mm. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's with us in hard places. He gives directions along the way. And one more good reason to travel with Jesus is this. If you'll stay with Jesus, sooner or later you'll experience revelation, discovery moments. Boy, I love these. I love when Jesus shows up out of nowhere with undeniable evidence that he's there. Whew. Verse 29, stay with us. How many of you think that's like a good prayer? Pray every day. Stay with me, Jesus. Yeah. Or maybe we should say this, help me to stay with you, Jesus. And then their eyes were open and they saw him and they saw said to each other, man, weren't our hearts on fire when he was walking with us on the road? These guys come to a critical place on the road. They've come through a hard place. They've listened to Jesus give them directions. And now they come to a place, an important place in the road to discovery where they have the chance to part ways with Jesus. What an important place, right? Don't miss this today. Verse 28, as they approach the village Check this out. Jesus acted as if he were going to go further. Jesus acted like he was, I got an appointment somewhere. He acted like he had somewhere to go. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. I love that. Don't miss this. Jesus acted as if he was going on without them. It's almost like he's baiting them. It's almost like he's, he's baiting them to say, do you want me to stick around? 
And this is the moment of truth for so many people as they walk down the road to discovery. And they say, we've walked all this way together. Man, we've enjoyed your company. And, and he's saying to them, do you want me to walk on? Do you, do you want to walk on without me? Or do you want me to stay and show you some more? And they said, wisely, Jesus. They don't know it's him. They, they said, stay with us, please. We have so much more traveling yet to do, and you're such a great companion on the journey. Please stick around. Please stay with us. And he went in and tried to picture it in your mind's eye today. He sits down at the table with them. They hand him the bread. And he must have said something like, do you mind? Because it was normally the host's job to break the bread and pronounce blessing over it. And they're like, something inside him said, go ahead. And Jesus lifts the bread, and as his arms go up, his sleeves fall down, and they see the nail prints. And he breaks the bread, and their eyes are open, and they recognize this stranger they've been traveling with is in fact no stranger at all. God has been walking with them all the time. It's a revelation moment. Jesus appears out of nowhere. I've been there before. God, you feel so far. I know you're here. I know you still love me. But the pain is so deep and the road is so hard. And I just, I miss you. And I, I don't know what's going on. And I feel broken. And I feel lonely. And I feel discouraged. And then all of a sudden this presence comes in the room. <laughs> And he finds me, or I find him again. And you know what those moments are like? I mean, they're like revelation. There you are, Jesus. I'll bet you've had moments like that. Many of you have had. Anyone who's walked with Jesus long enough, you've had moments like that. In a moment of revelation, we see Jesus out of nowhere. And then we look back down the road and we see, in fact, that he had been there with us all the time. And we just kept missing him. And now we look back and we say, well, how did I miss him? He was there. And he was there. And he was there. And I don't know how I missed him. He was there all the time. And if you're in a hard place on the road and yet you feel your heart burning within you this morning and you feel that sense of hope, there's a good chance it's Him. He's here. He's with you. He knows your pain. He's seen each silent tear. He hears the heart cry in the middle of the night. He's never left you. You just missed Him. And you feel a nudging today and a pushing, even if it's an uncomfortable rebuke. Come on, move away from there. Get out of that situation. Get out of that relationship. Break that habit. You don't have to live here any longer. Swallow your pride. Have faith in me. Let me lead you on past this hard place on the road, down the road of life. And Some of you right now, perhaps, are having that revelation moment because you've said, Jesus, I want you to stay. <laughs> I want you to help me stay with you for life. For life. Don't ever leave me, Jesus. He says, I never will. If you ask him, he will walk with you till the pavement ends and beyond. David said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Mike or somebody maybe want to come back as we wrap this up today. How does somebody start a long journey with Jesus? Somebody said a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. How about it, Brian? You've hiked the Himalayas. Hard trek begins with, here we go. One step. One step. Have you taken a step towards Jesus on the path of life? Take a step this morning in his direction. We've been praying you would. 
We've been praying you would find him. We'd be praying you'd feel your heart burning within you this morning that out of nowhere in your life that God, supernatural God, would show up. You find him on the narrow road. Jesus said one place, Matthew 7, broad is the road that leads to destruction and all kinds of people find it, sadly. But narrow. You find me on the narrow road. Narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few We'll find it. Heads are bowed and eyes closed. You find yourself today at a crossroads on the road to life. How many times will you come to this place where Jesus beckons, offers to walk with you? He came a long, long way so he could walk with you through the road of life, through the hard places, so he could whisper in your ear, come over here, follow me this way. Let me lead you out of that. Let me lead you into something better. Revelation moment. It can happen right now. Where all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God becomes personal in your life. He like explodes inside your chest and your life. And you realize God's real. He is real. He's powerful. He's beyond your understanding. He loves you. And you stand at the crossroads. And will you choose Jesus and begin to walk with him down the road? to discovery or will you choose to walk on alone without him I hope today will be the day that you say Jesus stay with me (laughs) Jesus come into my house come into my heart because I got a lot a long journey still ahead of me and I could use your help I could use your forgiveness Stay with me. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and you're there in a personal, private moment with Jesus. It can be for you that revelation, that discovery moment when you find out that God is in fact real, that you can in fact know Him personally, that He can forgive all of your sins. All of your guilt can be taken away. And that discovery moment, it happened for those guys with a prayer. It happens for you with a prayer where you say, Jesus, come into my life. I want you to stay in my house. Come into my home. Come into my heart. Live with me. Stay with me forever, Jesus. And he forgives your sins. And he gives you assurance in your heart that when you die, you keep right on walking with Jesus. You go right on to home with Jesus. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. People are praying for you right now. You say, I want Jesus to come in and stay with me. I want him to live in my heart. I don't want to take another step on the road of life without Jesus. I need him to forgive me. I need him to take away this this unsettledness and give me peace. If that's you, raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Three, bet you raise your hand across this place. God bless you. I see a couple young ladies right here in the middle section. Yes, I want to walk with Jesus. I want to walk out of here with Jesus. This is awesome. Come on, pray a little bit more because you know what it's like to sit there and struggle with this moment. Do not let God bless you. Uh, Right here in this section, I see your hand. You know what it's like. Pride comes in. You're like, you don't need help. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. It's a hard life right outside these doors. He's here offering you fresh direction and forgiveness. If you've not raised your hand and you know you should, lift it right now. And then we're going to pray. Anybody else? God bless you on the front row. Anybody else? I saw that hand right there. Anyone else? God bless you, sir. Over here to my left, a young guy. That's awesome best decision you'll ever make ask Jesus to come in and walk with him I've seen four or five hands at least God may have seen something more than I did because that's what he does we're going to pray right now you're going to have the opportunity to say a prayer it's not my words it's going to save you but it's going to be something in your heart and, and it could be just like this Jesus come in and live in me Jesus stay with me Jesus forgive me we're going to pray a prayer just like that are you ready Everybody in the room, repeat this prayer. Jesus, I want you to walk with me. You came a long way 
so we could go on a journey together. And I need you to forgive me of my sin. Start me on the right path. Get me headed towards God. Take me on home someday to heaven. On this day, I start walking with Jesus. Come in. Stay with me from now on. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Somebody party with me. We celebrate together. Stand to your feet all over this place today. Prayer partners, if you'd come down front, if you prayed that prayer, I'd love to meet you. There's nothing that gets me more pumped up than meeting people that pray that prayer. I'd love to meet you personally. I'd love to celebrate with you. Slap you five. We'd love to give you uh, uh, information on how to get in one of our starting point groups because we don't want you to walk alone. Praise the Lord. Have an awesome afternoon. Our prayer partners are down here. Come and tell us uh, hello. Spend some time with us. We'll be glad to spend a little time. Get some of these cards. Invite somebody next week to Jesus out of nowhere. We'll be talking about how Jesus shows up out of nowhere in the midst of our doubts. In the midst of our doubts.